Hi, everybody. My name's Greg. I work for Opsi. And we are an AWS monitoring company, and our product is written entirely in Go. And I am here to talk to you about dependency management in Go, which is everybody's favorite water cooler topic, because dependency management in Go is hard. And it's hard everywhere, and a lot of other more mature uh, programming languages have solved this problem in a lot of different ways. And in Go, we're starting to standardize around the Go vendor experiment, the different Go toolings that we have around vendor management uh, and dependency management and builds. And so in dealing with this, we have run into some interesting problems and some problematic dependencies. And I'd like to talk about what those are. So who am I and why am I here? I am the CTO at Opsi. I was the founding engineer, first engineer on the scene. I designed and built a very large portion of the product. We've been using Go in production for more than a year now. We, again, are almost entirely in Go. We have one or two closure services that are on their way out the door because we've now built a lot of uh, experience and expertise in Go, and we'd like to really focus and hone that as much as possible. And yeah, we're building a whole damn product in Go. Uh, we've even considered like generating the JavaScript for the front end from Go because we were going to do that with Clojure originally. And uh, but yeah, we're we're not going to do really smart, stupid things like that. And I like to talk to people about my problems because I find that when we're all sort of honest about the difficulties that we're having as a community, then it's much easier to find common ground and come together and be like, oh my God, you're having this problem too. Let's share ideas and thoughts about our proposed solutions. I give a lot of in-the-trenches talks. Uh, it's my favorite thing to do to go into a room full of people that I know are having a lot of the same problems that I am and tell them about my problems because it's very therapeutic and also people find this very useful. And a lot of the times when I go to conferences or meetups, they are very much, we had a problem and we solved it and this is how you should do it. And instead, what I like to look at is what are the realities and what led us to these problems and why might you run into these problems in the future? And very much try and help people avoid the these problems arising just naturally as a course of learning how to do things uh, before you have considerable expertise and experience built up in your organization. A little bit of background so that you understand exactly how Opsi works, so it gives you a little bit of context to what I'm going to describe and how we got here. We have really two primary components to Opsi. We have a stream processing pipeline, which of course everybody has now, and that is composed of a number of EC2 instances running in a bunch of customer environments in their own VPCs that talks back to Opsi over a message bus. And then we have a stream processing engine in our VPC that takes all of those messages, normalizes them, does deduplication, does everything that you need to do whenever you're working with lossy, uh, bad messaging protocols. And that component is entirely separate from the API that customers use to interact with our product. And so in building this, we looked at it and we said, well, we could build you know, one monolith and we could have everything in one process, or we could actually make these small, discrete, independently deployable components so that when we need to make drastic, severe changes to the API or when we have API downtime, that doesn't impact our stream processing capabilities because we understand that as a monitoring company, you rely on us to process events very quickly and expediently and reliably. So maybe let's segment responsibilities in our infrastructure and in our architecture. So microservices to the rescue, right? This is the new hotness, and this is what it's really all about. I know that there's a lot of talk that microservices came about as a, it's the, the concept that you're, we build systems that mimic the way we communicate and the, the mechanisms that we use to operate as people systems. And so we say, well, microservices came about because of this organizational problem. But we like to think of it as, well, actually, microservices came about because we can have a whole bunch of independently deployable components and a separation of concerns. So that's kind of how we got here. And in building this, you come into some interesting problems, right? Because you have services that need to talk and that need to coordinate, so you end up building APIs. So when we first started building all of our APIs for our backend services at Opsi, we did the standard HTTP JSON RPC API. 
So these are very easy to build and use. You end up writing your Go structs, those serialized to JSON. You have your request and response patterns. You expose these to the consuming services. And for the most part, this works really well. The thing that we ran into, and this was before the advent of like Go Micro, for example, which now gives us frameworks for doing all of this very easily without writing a lot of boilerplate code. But at the time, Go Micro was like number one on Hacker News the day that we were looking at building this. So we're not going to just jump into that boat uh, at the very beginning. So we looked at it and we said, okay, well, there's a lot of boilerplate code that we have to write. So why don't we either build a framework that makes sense to us or try and find a framework for inter-service communication that we don't have to write, that does as much code generation as possible, that gives us the ability to export client libraries to other services so they can consume from other services, and that gives us the ability to have a shared grammar that we can use for services to communicate. So we figure if we're going to be bleeding edge and do Go when it's barely more than a year old, let's really bleed and, and be super cutting edge, right? So we picked gRPC and protobuf because I, well, one, I really like gRPC. I think that it solves a very specific problem, which is well-defined interfaces for services. And I like protobuf and gRPC together because it generates a significant amount of code that we don't have to write. We have a declarative syntax for all of our service interfaces, for all of the pro uh, objects that they use to communicate with one another. And so we can use gRPC and protobuf very simply. All of that code is generated. It's a lot of stuff we don't have to do, and it's very easy to share code between services. So this is how our BASIC repository came about. And BASIC is our shared central library that contains all of our common object models. And as you can see here, this is a screenshot of our, our GitHub repository. The, we ended up going with this shared library approach because we had basically two options. We could centralize all of these inter-service communication tidbits in one place and set up dependencies very deliberately on that one shared location, or we can end up with a very complicated dependency graph between all of our services where one service will import from multiple other services that it consumes from, and tracking down all of those dependencies is less explicit, and you end up having to have implicit dependency evaluation to figure out what's going on where. So we decided to centralize everything because really this is all about shared dependencies and we want to make sure that we're very careful about injecting shared dependencies into our application architecture because, as everybody knows, when you start to share dependencies between applications, things get really complicated. You end up having to update one dependency across a number of independent components all at the same time. And that can be really difficult, and it's a trying problem, so let's be really careful about it and really explicit about what we're doing. What's the problem that we actually ran into? As I said, we decided to use gRPC. The mistake that I think we made was that we tightly coupled ourselves to gRPC in our interactions between services because we actually exposed gRPC to other services. When you do that, you end up just by virtue of being a Go development shop and doing things the Go way, right? A new developer comes in, he's going to build or she is going to build a new service in Go that's going to talk to another service, right? So it's like, okay, well, I need to go get google.golang.org slash gRPC, and then I'm going to build that into my product and, or my project, and I'm going to expose a gRPC service, and I'm going to consume other gRPC services, and I'm going to vendor the version of gRPC that I'm building against, and so on and so forth, and other projects will vendor the version that they're going for, but we've exposed gRPC as a dependency in both places. And it turns out that interfaces exported by gRPC change rather frequently. And you'd think that it can't be that bad, right? Like, these people are developers too. They understand that if people are coding to their public interfaces, that maybe they should be good citizens, maybe they should not change their public API, six to 12 times in a year, uh, multiple times a month, possibly even. So as a concrete example, we have a service called Gamunch. And all Gamunch does is 
abstract away the fact that we use Kinesis or SQS or SNS or NSQ, and we say, look, you can publish an event, and we will tell you if that made it where it was supposed to go. And all you have to do is use this common event grammar and this common service. You publish an event, and then other consumers can find it, and we just abstract the actual message bus away from people so that not everybody is having to use Kinesis directly, not everybody is having to use SQS directly, et cetera. Because we use a lot of different message buses at Opsy, so abstracting this actually made sense for us. And this is the exported client from Gamunch. It's very simple. As you can see, there's one method. It's just send, right? Yeah. Send the name of the event type, I think, and then the actual event object so that we can route it. Very simple. But as you can see, one of the arguments to creating this exported client is the gRPC credentials.transport authenticator, which is an interface. Fortunately, there are a lot of different implementations of that in the gRPC uh, package. So it, it exports this interface, and that's something that you have to end up passing. So let's write a service that uses Gamunch, right? So we import our Gamunch client library that somebody has thankfully built for us. It handles you know, circuit breakers, back off, all this stuff for us that we didn't have to do because we're a consumer. And then it imports the google.golang.org gRPC credentials. So credentials.newTLS is a function that returns a transport authenticator in gRPC that adheres to this interface using TLS to authenticate with client-based certificate authentication from the client service to the server and does all this stuff for you. But it turns out that there was a commit that changed transport authenticator to transport credentials in the interface name, right? So we have Gamunch, which has a specific version of gRPC vendored, and we have our new service that has another version of gRPC vendored with the new interface name. So we end up with a compile time error like this, that's saying, oh, your new TLS, the thing that was returned by new TLS, doesn't actually, isn't actually an implementer of this interface, it's an implementer of a different interface. And so you end up doing this once every three months, right? <laughs> And you're just, what? W what is going on here? And so you end up having to go back to the gRPC code. And you have to look at implementation details, and you have to figure out exactly what changed, look at commit logs. And this is really bad behavior for a public API, right? And this comes from the Golang way of doing things of let's just not version APIs. Let's use git shaws that point to whatever version of the Go package that we're going to use. And I know that there's gopackage.in, right? And that will let you sort of version your APIs through package redirection. Like you can say, use go package.in dash gRPC v1. And that will be a specific version of the interface. And if you're a, a being very good in your behavior and you don't change your public interfaces a lot, then something like go package.in works. But in the case of gRPC, this happens a lot. Like if they used go package.in for this, they'd be on v103, right? And so, we look at this and we say, I kind of miss the Semver shit show that was Ruby that we had, you know, a year ago where we just had our bundle file and it was very clear what we were doing. Instead, we have to do things like this where we say, okay, everybody, if you're going to use gRPC, here's the git SHA that you need to check out after you go get. If you're going to use protobuf, here's what you need to use. If you're going to use gogo proto, which are extensions on protobuf, here's the git SHA you need to check out. And yes, we could do tooling around this, and we could automate all this, we could make it a lot easier, but we have three developers, and we run into this problem very infrequently because we figured out how to work around it. But we've reached the tipping point now, where we're building things so quickly, because we've gotten very good at Go, I'm not gonna lie, like we're, we've really increased our development velocity because we chose to go with Go and because we standardized around a single language and decided to all build a lot of expertise in it. We decided, let's just fix this. Let's not spend another hour on this, because we have. I think at this point we probably spent 12 hours of development time remembering that this problem happened and then fixing it everywhere, because remember, all of our services use gRPC to communicate with one another. So every time we decide to upgrade a version of gRPC, we have to go do it in every single repository in order to make sure that we're consistent in all of the interfaces that we're exporting, right? So 
Things that I would like to have in fixing this problem are no more shared dependency version conflicts, right? And we have a sensible build system right now, and I would like to continue to have a sensible build system in the future. Things that would be really nice to continue to have, go get still works, that's how we get dependencies. Go build still builds projects upon checkout, that's a really nice thing. And I'd like to be able to easily update dependencies across all projects. And the caveat there is that really, we should have figured out how to architect in a way that, that, that this was never a problem, right? And that actually is one of the solutions that I am going to talk about. So it sounds easy, but it's actually not super easy when you really sit down and start to think about the different solutions for this problem rather than like jump on a particular bandwagon of doing things. So the first solution we thought about was uh, DIP, which is de the dependency inversion principle. And what this says is, OK, I understand that you're using gRPC for your transport, but don't directly expose that to me. That's kind of like, I can't remember who it was that came out. It was HECA, actually. HECA decided we're going to, Mozilla decided we're going to stop actively developing HECA because the APIs were just too unwieldy, and we relied too heavily on exposed channels and all of our APIs, and then channels ended up not scaling the way that we needed HECA to scale. So we've kind of done the same thing with gRPC now. We've directly exposed gRPC as our transport, and we've relied on client libraries to expose bits of gRPC whenever we need them to, when in reality what we should have done is completely abstracted away the fact that we're using gRPC, put a public interface that's unchanging in front of it, and then had the unexported structs that implement those interfaces in each of our projects. And so we end up with something that's kind of like this. And all of this is uh, on GitHub, and I have links to it all if you actually want to see this. But basically, the very top part is all of our exported structs and interfaces, and that is the, the, the part that does not expose gRPC. And then the gRPC service client actually goes through and says, oh, OK, I'm going to do all the gRPC stuff, but I'm going to hide it from you. The advantages of this, we are free of the tyranny of gRPC developers, right? So gRPC people are free to change their interfaces as much as possible. Our new services can vendor whatever version of gRPC they want, and it doesn't matter because the underlying protocol is still protobuf. It's not going to change a lot. It's all over HTTP2. The semantics of gRPC inter-service communication aren't what change a lot. It's the actual interfaces that Go is exposing. Go get and go build, keep working. That's fantastic. We really like that. We feel like we're being good software engineers because we're software engineering the hell out of this. We're using like design patterns and good software engineering principles to solve our problem, and that feels great. And we don't have to do either of the two next solutions that I kind of don't like, basically. <laughs> but we'll end up doing something like them anyway. Uh, disadvantages of this, we have yet another shared dependency, right? So we now have a client library for each service. And any service that's going to use this exported interface now has to update that exported interface whenever it changes, because it's going to abstract away the fact that something in gRPC changed or some semantic and in inter-service communication changed. So we really haven't solved our problem. But we've papered over it enough that we can get along without running into this issue of the gRPC interfaces changing, again, for quite a while, I think. And we'd have to write some generators for this, right? Because nobody wants to actually write all of these wrapper libraries around gRPC. So what would be really nice is if we could still use the declarative semantics of gRPC and protobuf to generate these wrapper libraries, and, or at least start writing the, the wrapper libraries with generated code, right? That would be wonderful. Solution two is a monorepo. Everybody loves monorepo when you're working in Go. Go was born in a monorepo. gRPC and protobuf were born in a monorepo, and it shows. So there's an article that I read in researching monorepos, The Advantages of Monolithic Version Control. It's very good. I highly recommend anybody considering a move to monorepo. I, maybe all of you are already using monorepos, and you've already solved my problem. If so, please come talk to me after this. I would love to hear your stories. But I highly recommend reading this article. Advantages of monorepo are auto atomic updates to dependencies. This is fantastic. If I'm going to go in and I'm going to say, gRPC is getting updated, I can run our build and test suite. And every single service that does not comply with the new interfaces can be changed. Everything will be fine. It's 
some upfront work whenever you want to update a dependency, but for the most part, I think it's worthwhile upfront work because it's work you're going to have to do anyway. So let's just be very you know, real about what we're needing to do. We no longer have to use vendoring tools, which I am actually really thrilled about because every time we update something like Go Vendor or GB, we end up having backward compatibility problems, and maybe this is something you've run into as well in working with vendor tools. So that's a thing that I don't really want to have to do anymore. And it's really easy to audit the accretion of external dependencies. One of the things that ends up happening is as we progress as developers, we learn about new tools that solve problems that we've had before, and so we then add that as another dependency for another service instead of continuing to build or contribute to an external dependency that we have already developed expertise in. So that's an excellent thing too. Disadvantages, CI sucks. Monorepo CI sucks, and it's amazing to me because we've been using monorepos for like 100 years, but all of the CI SaaS products are very difficult to use with, with monorepos, and I don't really like that. Ironically, GoGet doesn't really work super well with monorepos. You end up having to write tooling around that. And so we'll end up having to write tooling just to new vendor management, basically, tooling to handle uh, GoGet and getting dependencies into a monorepo. The third solution that we're considering is a monolithic build container. So we already actually build in containers. We have a base build container that contains protobuf, all of our gRPC and protobuf code generators, a lot of shared internal tooling, and a handful of packages that we've decided to strictly version, like protobuf gRPC and gogo proto. All of those are in the base build container. What we're thinking is maybe not every dependency goes into the build container, but at least all of our shared core libraries, so basic that I showed you earlier would go in there, gRPC would continue to be in there, and the key thing here is that we stop vendoring those libraries individually in product projects. The nice thing about that is, again, we already have tooling built around doing all of this. We have none of the VCS difficulties and CI difficulties that we might have with monorepos, and it just sort of fits with our organization right now. The disadvantages are bye-bye, go get, and go build. That's just not really a thing. You can do it for the initial dependency retrieval, but you still have to have tooling to get it into the build container, and developers then also have to have specialized knowledge of what they can and can't vendor in their own products. So there's some work there to be done that I think we can probably do, including setting up build dependencies and CI for this build container. So that's, that's a thing that's not so bad, but for the most part, it's still going to be fairly difficult, and I think even worse than the monorepo itself, because now we've really divided concerns between two different areas, and I don't really, I don't like that, because I like being explicit about what we're doing, as opposed to people having to go to multiple sources of truth to figure out what they need to do. It just slows you down. So what are we going to do? Uh, as Donald Rumsfeld once famously said, I'm not into this detail stuff, I'm more concepty. So I'm going to propose some solutions to people and let them make the decision so I can just blame them when it doesn't work out. No, I'm just kidding. This is totally going to be the thing that I end up building. I'm just really not sure what I want to do yet. I would love, seriously, I would love to hear about what people are doing. In researching this, the thing that I found so surprising is that one, everyone has this problem, and two, nobody's saying what they're doing. So either it's the world's worst nightmare waiting to reap what you, what, we're gonna reap what we sow, right? Like this is gonna come back to bite us in the butt. So we have our knowns, we have our unknowns, we know what we don't know, we know what we do know. And so it's just a matter of starting to experiment with the three paths that we've basically chosen. I really like, uh, using dependency inversion to engineer away this problem as much as I can, and we'll probably do that in conjunction with something like a monorepo. But for the most part, it's just, it's really hard to commit to anything when it's really just something that comes up every now and then. But it is something that I know we're going to have to really solve if we're going to ever scale. So I would love to hear thoughts, questions, etc. That's really all I have. I'm Grepery on Twitter. If you want to hit me up afterward, I will be around if you want to talk to me and try Opsy. And that's it.
Yeah, so we use, we use GoVendor, which is another vendoring management tool. And so we do vendor all of our dependencies right now. Uh, but Glide has the same problems that GoVendor has. Uh, it really doesn't, it doesn't fix the problem we have, which is our shared dependencies end up changing, and we have to address the changes in those in a way that is lengthy and disorganized. But we looked at Glide, GB, GoDep, and GoVendor, and ended up using GoVendor because it was just the most straightforward and simple. Yeah, so that's, that's basically what we're looking to do, I think, with a mono repo. But that's, that's sort of the, let's not put our project code in there. Let's make the rest of the Go path a single repository. And I actually like that approach. It's one that I hadn't really seriously considered because I got stuck on the train of it just all has to be in the same repository. But really, it doesn't. Like, you could just have a single vendor because, you know, GoPath can be segmented between multiple paths. So we just say, if you're working on Opsy, you're going to use this section in your GoPath for all of our vendor stuff. And I think that that would work really well, actually. It's a lot simpler, too. The, we still have the same problem there that we have with the monolithic build container, I think, except that we're saying you specifically vendor all of your stuff into this one repository, so that's a little bit better there. But we do have now a dependency that we have to automate builds around, where if you're going to make a change to the vendor repository, you now have to test all of the stuff in all of the rest of the repositories. But we'll be able to reuse a lot of our current CI tooling. So that's actually something I'm going to consider now. So thanks. I appreciate that. One of the things that I, one of the problems that I ran into with the mono repo was pretty much around build tooling. I'm very lazy, you see. And I've already done all of the build automation for one way of doing things. I'd really rather not have to rewrite all of my build automation to, for example, if we had a monorepo, right, and we didn't want to manage a central circle YAML or something if we continue to use circle CI, we'd probably end up having to write a tool to parallelize builds somehow with some other kind of weird Circle CI integration, or we'd have to choose another CI vendor. And we've been looking at Worker, but we're not really ready to make the switch. Their workflows and build pipelines might make some of this a little bit easier. So we just haven't really investigated the tooling to understand exactly how much work a monorepo switch would be. So it's an un there are unknown unknowns there for me. And I don't. Like, I haven't discounted it, right? Like, it's in the list of three real, well, now four solutions that we're going to consider. And I think that we still have some of those problems with, like, this, this new suggestion of just a vendor monorepo. So I think that we will end up going that route. It's just going to be a lot more work than I think we know right now. So I'm trying to not do that until I absolutely have to. I think that's all the time I have. Yeah. <laughs>